uh, let's talk about the Brit Awards. I mentioned it earlier. And I remember the Spice Girls at the Brit Awards. And I know, Greg, you've worked uh, with the Spice Girls, haven't you? Indeed. I was saying to David earlier, I do remember a time when um, it's, a, it's a funny thing where you're, you're in, the, in a situation at the time and you don't think anything of it. And then it turns out many years later that it, it, it's a sort of major cultural happening. Uh, and I remember that with the Spice Girls at the Brits. They arrived. I went out to meet Nikki Chapman, who was with them uh, at the car. The girls got out of the car and went inside. And I helped Nikki in with the bags. And she said, oh, can you carry this? And I held up this hanger. And it was the, what looked like a tea towel. And it was a Union Jack. And I thought, what's this? And she said, oh, that's Jerry's dress. She's going to wear that later. And it was a tea towel. It was, it was made out of two tea towels. And I, I don't know if anyone can remember what was on the back. It was actually black with a peace sign on it. And there was yeah. Tea stain, maybe. <laughs> and I took this in and I went, turned it into the dressing room and hung it onto the hook. And then now that dress is kind of in a museum and it's become this kind of iconic image of the 90s. Yeah. Um, but I know that, what memories do you have of working with the Spice Girls, Greg? Uh, a lot, some very good and some not so good. And um, the pair of Union Jack boots that she wore with that dress, I own. Ah, do you? Uh, yeah, and that's uh, another item that my three daughters keep telling me they're going to own. Um, yeah, so Simon Fuller uh, was a publisher at Chrysalis Music when I was doing disco promotion and moved into marketing Adam and uh, Michael Jackson and all sorts. And um, we had a mutual respect for each other. I'd be over at Chrysalis, uh, you know, and talking music. And um, fast forward several years, and I've produced uh, people like Jose Carreras in the Royal Crescent in Bath that I mentioned, and uh, Kirita Karnawa and Placido Domingo at oh, Stately nice. Homes. I was working with IMG Artists with a co-producer. And uh, I invited Simon down to see the uh, Kirita Kanu gig because I said look I'd like to put Annie Lennox on because he was managing Annie because I said she'd be perfect we'd have an orchestra it's a lovely setting and he said I, I really enjoyed the gig but Annie's not up for gigging at the moment and then I went to see him in his office and I had an idea to do a promotion with the Spice Girls because I'm a marketeer at heart um, with Disco's Crisps by Walkers and I did a mock-up of the artwork and I said I think these would sell millions we can sort of put a vague impression of the girls faces on these circular potato crisps and on the packet and they're so big he said I love the idea but I just signed a deal with Pepsi and I actually I think Disco's must have been another manufacturer because I think Pepsi was part of Walker's so we've done a deal with Pepsi the rival and so we can't do any other deal he said but um he said uh, and then we started chatting and I said look it's amazing what the Spice Girls are doing I said what's next presumably you're going to want to do some live gigs he said yeah that's going to be really hard because you know they've never done live before and they're young and uh, I said, oh, that would be, I mean, there is an opportunity to do one of the best world tours in the world. I mean, it could be phenomenal. The sky's the limit, you know, there's, there's nothing holding you back. And he sat back in his chair and said, yeah. And he said, uh, how about you produce and direct it? And I said, yeah, that'd be terrific. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I came out of his office and I called my assistant, must have been mobile phones. And I said, Amanda, there's good and bad news. What do you want first? So oh, give me the bad news. So, well, I he hasn't bit the Disco's Walker's Chris promotion idea. He said, oh, that's a shame. What's the good news? I said, well, we're going to be producing, directing the world tour. She screamed <laughs> out. And I, I hightailed it back to my office in, in the Twickenham and we got busy on it. So basically, I, I took over that responsibility. I worked with designers. I put the band together, including the MD, Simon Ellis. They were on really huge good money. Um, really tight band. I mean, Steve, you'll know most of the names. Um, fantastic musicians. We built up um, a crew from the musicians and rehearsing in London. And then because the girls were having to do a taxi route, we took a chateau in uh, just outside of Cannes, a sort of sub Cannes little village. And uh, so they were in there at 10 grand a, a month. And this is 23 years ago. Mm. And I hired a villa with my assistant and had a driver. And we took over a sports hall and we started to build up what the stage was like. First of all, it was just masking tape on the floor to give them their spots. Then we put the ramp on the stage. And as we designed it, we added elements until we did six weeks of absolute 12 hour a day rehearsals. So I put them through a 12 hour program. So every day a girl had a singing lesson. Every day a girl had a session with a trainer, physical trainer. I built a gym in the grounds of the 
uh, chateau they were staying in, which in the morning was heated because one of the girls liked to work out first thing. And in the evening when it was hot, it was air conditioned because they liked to work out late at night. We had three different chefs out there because three of them were so fussy that they wanted their own individual chefs. And so the crew were being catered by a top caterer, you know, choice of three, three and three, you know, feed a crew and feed the musicians on their stomach and their happy bunnies. So the food was delicious and we, we were out on the terrace at the sports hall having great grub and the girls were sitting in the corner and their chefs were sort of brewing up on a little Bunsen burner, you know, sort of like, <laughs> and, and they were getting, Victoria, you can have a piece of this and, and Emma have a piece of that. And Scary Spice, it was just, you know, jerk chicken and beans and yeah. lots of Caribbean food. She ate healthy. But some of the others, it was ridiculous. You know, you'd look at their plate and say, where's the food? And they'd say, well, it's there. And i said, well, no, that's not the food. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, Jerry came to me and said, Greg, she said, look, you know, my singing's not so good or my dancing. I want an extra hour of dancing and an extra hour of choreography and an extra hour of singing a day. So she was doing a 14 hour day and I got our coaches to give her the extra hour. Anyway, we built up, we then shipped 140 people and all the set from the south of France and those that came in from England over to Istanbul where we built the set over four days in a very small relatively speaking basketball arena where the access was only a regular double door and this set was a roller coaster with a mini a full-size mini stripped out on top all painted as a glitter ball and we did two gigs uh they were I think a 32 camera shoot two consecutive nights but the audience was limp as because Pepsi was sponsoring it, they gave us half a million quid. I mean, the show cost two million quid for two nights, but it was the beginning of the world tour, so it was an investment. Yeah. And we amortized it across the world tour. Um, the audience were competition winners. If you pulled a ring of a Pepsi can a few months before, you'd win a ticket. But no one in Turkey really knew of the Spice Girls at all. So there were a few banners. The audience reaction was limp. And we knew it was going to happen. So when I edited the film, I went into the studio and I lifted all the audience sound out of a Michael Jackson private concert in uh, Dubai. <laughs> he went over to play for Prince and they were screaming and yelling. And I just stole the audience because there was no noise. And in fact, if you look at the concert video, which is, yeah. is available, you every time you cut to the audience, there's sort of limp. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was appalling. You know, I, I actually said to Simon, shall I cut in an audience from an England ven English venue? And he said, no, we can't do that. I said, well, we can't have the audio. There's no clapping or screaming. So uh, that was fine. And then we went over to do the MTV Awards. And the night before the gig, uh, there was a dress rehearsal, but the girls were with Mandela, so they couldn't be in town. So I flew in five stand-in dancers. I printed a T-shirt with each girl, so it said, scary, ginger, baby. And so the director could see where the girls would be standing. And it was a multifaceted set, three different levels. So they were all coming in from different areas and then ending up as one in the middle of the stage on the ground floor. But they all started at different levels, very complex. Um, filmed that rehearsal, the morning of the gig, went to the hotel with the girls, showed them the rehearsals and said that is quite complex, but here it is, this is what we did yesterday, Are you okay? Yeah, we'll do it, Greg, no problem. And then I showed them the opening sequence for the world tour, which was them crash landing to earth from a rocket, having been delayed coming to Wembley Arena from the moon, it was crazy. And then they asked their security guys and their PAs to leave the room. And I was sat there alone with them. And I thought, uh oh, this, this hasn't happened very often to me. And then they eventually, and it took a lot of time as they looked at each other quite sheepishly, and then they basically said, we're sacking Simon Fuller. Oh, right. So I was the first person in the world, apart from their new legal team that knew it, and then all hell broke loose. And then that's where I have to stop talking. But um, yeah, it was very messy. And then I never went on the road during the world tour because I backed out of the situation uh, and I had to get involved with legal and it was two years of shit and crap. And uh, not one of the most edifying experiences I had, um, uh, you know, but up until that point, it was a roller coaster and terrific fun. And I love them to bits. Um, when I first met them, Simon invited me up to Ali Pali because they were doing a PA singing to backing tracks for the launch of the new McLaren F1 team, the cars and the drivers. Mm. I think it might have been Jensen Button and someone else, maybe Lewis. I can't remember. No, probably not Lewis 20 years ago. Um, and um the next day we flew in a private jet somewhere 
and Jerry made a beeline for me, sat on my lap, gave me a great big lipstick kiss. Greg, this is going to be fantastic. You know, we really, Simon speaks so highly of you. It's going to be great. We love you. We'll do what you say. And then very cleverly, because she was genius at this, she went straight up to my assistant, Amanda, and, and then sat next to her and gave it the whole girl power thing. Come on, Amanda, it's us against the boys. Mm. She was so brilliant with that. And that's why, you know, she was instrumental in getting so many people on her side. So that was just about the end of the story. You know, they were they were great fun to work with, but it didn't last long enough. I'd have loved to have gone on further with them. The, that very week when you found out they were sacking him, I ended up uh, doing something for him in Cannes, which was the launch of S Club 7. Yeah. And jokingly, when he came, came out, we went to check out the stage and everything. And I said, uh, oh, well, that you, you know, shame about the Spice Girls. And, and he was talking to someone else. He went, oh, well, this, this will make me 12 million. And I joked and went, <laughs> I bet you wish. And he just looked me straight in the eyes and went, oh, no, of course it will. And, yeah. off. and sure yeah. enough, we launched this Club 7 and we know the answer to that as well. So, yeah. coincidences. Wow.